because in our church, that's what works in our church, unity. And to see it in the youth ministry, there's no fighting, there's no shoving, there's anything else. In fact, people that needed help getting on, people were helping. I got kicked in the face like three or four times. <laughs> you know, me and Tim, you know. And then my daughter, all of a sudden, she, she, got, she got hurt, not badly hurt, but she got like a, rug, like a rope burn or something. And I hear the teens are like, hey, your, your, your daughter's really hurt. I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding, because I'm all the way to, like, on the other side. So I'm swimming, like, I'm like, I'm coming, baby, I'm coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm about passing out, right? <laughs> and I get there, and I have to go through this tunnel and everything else. And I'm like, "Are you gonna kid me?" And obviously, you know, she's upset. So, so I'm carrying her back. I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, like Baywatch, but not right. You know, <laughs> I'm going back. I'm going back, and I'm so tired. And Tim's like, "You want some help over there, buddy?" <laughs> Like, yeah, and it was tough, right? We, we were like, you know, we're thinking about the Marines just knocking somebody out if they have to keep moving. But anyhow, we got her to the shore. Everything's fine. But what a great day yesterday. And so I am planning a church trip. We're going to do it as a church, and it's going to be amazing to watch you guys flop. <laughs> <laughs> well, barbecue there. I'm thinking, you know, a little barbecue. There's a picnic tables and everything else there. But what a wonderful day it was. The teens really had a good time, um, I hope. And uh, it's just a good just to be the church. Amen. All right, let's get into the word. Man, my triceps are like worked out, so. All right, here we go. So I want to start off with a subtext, and uh, it's in Psalm 23. It's a famous passage. I think you'll know it. Um, In Psalm 23, it talks about a a lot of it um, has to do with, with fear, fear of the unknown, fear of where you're placed or whatever it is. In Psalm 23, a lot of preachers use it for funerals and everything else. And so I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to really go to the main text. But I just want to kind of highlight this in Psalm 23, 1 through 6. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk, ready, through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord for eight, forever and ever. Isn't that awesome? That's a powerful scripture. Amen? Amen. And, and so I want to come with a word of encouragement uh, for you today. Because, like I said, a lot of times I, I preach that scripture uh, at funerals. And it's a word of encouragement to help those that have lost in their life, you know, just help them see that if the person is saved, that, you know, they're going to the better side, you know, they're, and then you here can make it through. God is with you. And, and so I'm going to flip it around now. I'm not going to do it for a funeral, but I, I'm really going to look at, uh, you know, the side of things that what does it mean for us, you know, uh, that we're still here and we still face things. And so I, I want to start a new sermon series. Uh, it's going to be a three week series called The Highs, the Lows, and the So So's. Okay? The highs, the lows, and the so-sos. And the first part of this is the lows of learning I shall not want. The first part is the lows of learning I shall not want. And so I want you to open the Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8. That's really where I'm going to preach out of. Um, I'm just kind of bringing that in there as in the Psalms. But this scripture, this whole passage I'm going to read, I want you to see some things. I want you to, before we get going here, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal some things to you specifically because there's a lot packed in this passage. So let's pray. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, today is the day. It's a beautiful day, Lord. It's a day of recognizing that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and we pronounce that right now and announce that over our lives and over our families right now. We ask right now for your protection right now around this church, over our camp, put your angels around this place. Lord, we pray as this word goes forward, Lord, I ask right now that it would do what it's called to do, Lord. You called it. You spoke into it. You gave life to it. And I pray it would begin to embed into all of our lifestyles so that we will grow. We will mature. We will be saints that are mature. But, Lord, that we will not forget you. We will not forget you. A lot of times, Lord, we forget you when the bad things come. And I just ask right now, Lord God, that you would just give peace of mind to everybody here that's facing some kind of trial or tribulation right now. And everybody that said, Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 8, really the whole passage uh, goes all the way to 20. And I'm going to read it. It says, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on the oath of your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart 
whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. By the way, who else said that? Jesus. Yeah? So know that in your heart that a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of your Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Everybody say good land. A land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful, everybody say be careful, that you do not forget the Lord your God. Failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving to you to this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness that thirsty and waterless land with its, ven- with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you out of the water of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something that your ancestors had never known, right? And it goes on and on and on. And so he says, you may say to yourself, if you look at verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength and my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors. As it is today. Everybody say, as it is today. today. Listen, this word applies to us as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations that the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Now, there's some good stuff in here and there's some really hard stuff to chew on, isn't there? How many, has the Lord, how many of you this morning has the Lord blessed in some way, somehow? Yeah, Any, every one of us. There's recognition when it comes to when God begins to move in our lives and begins to bless us. But there's times that we also forget to give God praise. We get idle. We get in this world's culture and we forget about God, period. You ever been there before? Yeah. When things are going good, everything's right. Everything's fixed. You got money in the bank. Credit cards are all paid off. Yeah, right. But anyhow, anyhow, going on. All that stuff, you know, that we consider that is important to us, all of a sudden we start thinking we've done it with our own hands. I've heard many people say, well, my job, my job. It's not your job. It's God's job. God gave it to you. He can take it from you in a heartbeat. And oftentimes he does, ladies and gentlemen. In the times we live in, in this culture we live in right now, I feel like the church is going to be heading into some strange times, some difficult times. I've said that all along. But it's things that I'm seeing, things that are passing through, as I've always said week after week, I, I, I started thinking about how can I, Lord, how can I prepare people to the highs, lows, and the so-sos? Because when you look at a mountaintop, there's the highs, lows, and the so-sos. There's the valley. There's the middle and there's the top. Now, everybody likes to be on top of the mountain. Everyone here likes to be on top of the mountain, the good times. You don't, you're on vacation, man. You don't pay attention to nothing, right? You just live, 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 live. Problem is you start forgetting to recognize God has done it for you to get you to the mountaintop. And so oftentimes he will bring you to the valleys, which is where I'm going to start today. We're going to start with the lows. The lows, 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 the ones people don't want to go to. But I'm hoping that you will see by the end of this message that you'll begin to see why this three-part series, the lows are the best places to be. Even though I know, I know it hurts, I know it's difficult, I know at times you feel like you're never going to get through them, but guess what? How many have been through the lows and God brought you through? Some way, somehow. And you're here this morning and you don't have such a lows, you're maybe in the middle or the top. I don't know. Uh, I pray you're on the top for a while. That's great. But in the honesty of it all, we spend more time in the lows than we spend in the middles of the highs. Amen? And there's a, there's a reason for that. You see, everyone at some point will find themselves in the valley in their Christian walks. But wait a minute, Pastor Chris. Wait, 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 wait. 
We want the mountaintop. That's the good place. And you're correct. That is a great place. But realistically, we spend, as I said before, a lot more time in the valleys. So let's start with the valleys first, shall we? Amen? You see, it's not like the goo goos and gagas and cute, cuddly moments with Silas. My son is cute and cuddly right now, except for when he poops. It's not cute. It's not cuddly. And there are diapers that I have to take care of that I don't want to take care of. I'm just being realistic with you. Things I don't want to touch and smell and look at and everything else. But I have to get to through those things and move on past those, to go through those things, get those things out of there, put new on so I can spend time with the cute, cuddly goo-goos of Silas. It's the same with God. There are times that he wants to put you in the diaper club. You can write that in your notes. God wants me in the diaper club. Yeah, I thought about it, you know. He makes us spend a lot more time in the valley of diapers crying than on the mountaintops of smiles and giggles. You know, when Silas cries, I don't like him crying, but I know he has to because he was trying to communicate something to me as a father, and so as a father, I want to take care of it. But there's times that I don't take care of him. You know, he's only three months old. You are... No, that's not what I mean. I'm not taking care of him, okay? But when he cries, I don't always just answer right immediately because he needs to learn to figure out, right? And I need to hear certain cries to what they are. If I just answer every single time, every single time, and my wife, she's like, you gotta go get him. I see he needs to learn how to sleep. He needs to learn how to soothe himself. Amen? And sometimes God will put us in those valleys so you learn how to soothe yourself in his presence. You know how my son begins, Silas begins to learn how to soothe himself? He's always hungry, I swear. The kid's not 24 hours eating oatmeal now. And it's just like the oatmeal's gone, right? I'm like, I stir this thing up and it's that much oatmeal. And I'm like, where'd it go? He ate it all. He's hungry. But you know how he soothes himself now? When he starts crying, he's got this fist and he figured out how to put it in his mouth. And I think it's wonderful. I think that's a God-given thing right there. The Lord just answered my prayer. Not, he doesn't take pacifiers. He doesn't like pacifiers. I don't know why all my other kids like pacifiers, but he likes his fist. And I think that's great because that's how he sues himself. But he figured it out. And then I'll go and I'll say, oh, buddy, you figured it out. And I'll start coddling him and making sure that he's okay. Okay? And so here's the thing. I want to help you navigate in those valleys of many uncertainties. Because one thing I know is that the shepherd of the valley is also the shepherd of the mountaintop. He provides at all times, at all different places, how he wants to. And just right now, you may be in a valley right now. I'm speaking to some of you. You may be in a valley right now. You don't know how you're going to get out of it, but I promise you will, because you will. You will, all right? But I want to teach you in the valley how you can sustain, be sustained in the worst of times, and yet you can be so excited and happy about God's presence there. Let's pray. Lord, your word's your word. Now work. I thank you, Jesus, as I prayed before, but I pray right now, Lord, specifically that you teach us as a shepherd right now. Lord, I'm just the mouthpiece, the oracle that you've decided to use. I don't deserve to be here, Lord, but you are so great and you use the things that are not. So thank you, Lord. Now let's word go forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So a man found a cocoon of an emperor moth and took him home so he could watch the moth come out of the cocoon. One day a small opening appeared. The man sat and watched the month for several hours as it struggled to force its body through that little hole. And then it seemed to stop making any progress. To the man, it appeared as if the moth had gotten far as it could, breaking out of the cocoon and was stuck. Out of kindness, the man decided to help the moth. He took a pair of scissors and snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon so that the moth could get out. Soon the moth emerged, but it had a swollen body and small shriveled legs or wings. The man continued to watch the moth, expecting that in time the wings would enlarge and expand to be able to support the body, which would simultaneously con contract to its proportionate size. Neither happened. In fact, the little moth spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It was never able to fly. Can you see God in that? God wants you to struggle. God wants you to depend on him. But sometimes he doesn't cut you out. Sometimes he doesn't come to your aid when you call on him and you call and you pray. and you, Lord, I go to prayer every Saturday. If you just answered this prayer for me, my timing. And he doesn't. And things get worse and worse and worse. How many have been there before? And, and, and now you're in this place and you just wish that you could get out of this cocoon, but he's not, it's nothing, nothing's happening. Why? 
because he knows if he does it too early, you won't be able to fly. The man is kindness and haste didn't understand that restricting the cocoon and the struggle required for the moth to get through the tiny opening where God's ways, now watch this, this is like scientifically, okay, of forcing fluid from the body into the wings so that the moth would be ready for flight once it achieved its freedom from the cocoon. So God designed struggles. Imagine that. But you read in the scripture that we just read that he has absolutely prepared struggles for your life so that you grow. And you don't like them. I get it. I don't either. I don't like having to struggle. But it's part of the Christian walk. In fact, it's more 99% more than anything else that you'll ever do is struggling. So you might as well start understanding. You see, just as a moth could only achieve freedom of flight as a result of struggling, we often need to struggle to become all God intends us for, us for us to be. Sometimes we wish that God would remove our struggles and take away all the obstacles. But just as a man crippled the moth, so we would be crippled if God did that for us. God doesn't take away our problems and difficulties, but he promises, and I love this, to be with us through them, in the midst of them, and to use those problems to restore us, making us into a better, stronger people of God. Anybody with me? You see, in our text, the Lord brought blessings, testings, and troubles to his people in the desert in order, what? To teach them that our, their, their well-being, both physically and spiritually, depends on the relationship to God and the obedience to his word and making sure that they recognize that it is God who has done all the work. And God wants us to depend more on him and be more willing to accept his word I guarantee you that God is going to, and he already is right now, there's many things that are taking place. And I told you that at some point, the megachurches are going to start feeling the wrath of God. And I'm not against megachurches. When God grows a church, amen, amen, let's do it. Right? But, but here's the thing. Man gets prideful and starts doing things his own way and starts having an agenda, so to speak. And what takes place is then flesh comes in and then sin comes in and it just goes further and further and further and further until someday all of a sudden he's on the news. And so there's a lot of things taking place right now that the Holy Spirit is really shining his light on, you know. And, and, and so it's not that they didn't accept the words. The problem is, is they forgot the word. They forgot who has created the word and what it was intended to do. And they forgot the master, the shepherd in the valley. Amen. See, Satan wants to keep you on the mountaintop. Bet you never heard that before, but he wants to keep you on the mountaintop. He doesn't want to put you in the valley. He wants to keep you on the mountaintop. He wants to make you feel good. He wants to make sure that you, everything is good for you. Why? Because you're not paying attention. You're not growing. You're just staying idle. And that's exactly where he needs you to be. And a lot of church has been idle for quite some time. But things are shaking up the church now. Anybody agree? Amen. See, so we know the struggles, it stretches us and makes us more like God. But how do I endure the suffering that I go through? How do you endure it? You know, we just crawl up on the sheets and like, God, you don't love me. You just hate me. You just want me to be suffering, suffer. And he says, yeah, you're right. I want you to suffer, 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 suffer. But I love you. I want the very best for you. You may not feel it, but I love you. And I want the, I want the very best of you. You see, How do I endure the valley experiences that we all face in life? The answer is simple, having a purpose. Having a purpose. Knowing that God uses my valley experiences to make me more like him is a purpose that is greater than I can ever have. To become more like, we sing that song, if, if, if more of you means less of me, take everything. How many people did you see in the scripture that said, Lord, take it all, do it all. And then you see them excel in the kingdom of God and like no man can set them down because they know God. They know that even though these things come, persecution and everything else, you see, knowing that God uses those things, there comes a security knowing that God is making you more like him. And that's our goal, ladies and gentlemen. Us sitting here this morning is to become more like God, not more like your neighbor, not more like your husband or your wife. No, no it's more like God. Not like a Hollywood actor. I want to look like him. I want to be like him. No, I want you to become like me, God says. 
What kind of purpose can valley experiences bring to the Christian? Number one, valley experiences is necessary to get our attention. Charles Swindoll once found himself with too many commitments in too few days. He got nervous and tense about it. I was snapping at my wife and our children, choking down my food at mealtimes and feeling irritated at those unexpected interruptions throughout the day. By the way, I've been there. He recalled in this book of stress fractures, before long, things are around our home are starting to reflect the pattern of my hurry-up style. It was becoming unbearable in our home. Jesus was being pushed out. So I distinctly remember after supper one evening the words of our younger daughter, Colleen. She wanted to tell me something important that happened to her at school that day. She began hurriedly, Daddy, I want to tell you something. I want, and I'll tell you really fast, Daddy. Suddenly realizing her frustration, I answered, Honey, you can tell me, and you don't have to tell me really fast. Say it slowly. I'll never forget her answer. Then listen slowly. See, we're so busy that sometimes struggles can be used by God to get our attention. We need to slow down our minds as Christians and listen to what God is trying to say to us. It's hard for us to listen, though, amen? People, family, even God at times. Our attention span is not very long, especially mine. And they say the average adult attention, watch this, span is six minutes. Six minutes. I'm doing pretty good holding you guys here. Six minutes. That's ridiculous. Mine's like two. <laughs> but that's why I like TV, YouTube, and everything else. And have you noticed that, like, uh, it's funny because we were, we were watching, you know, there's a new Turner and Hooch on Disney+. Plus. Like, they took an 80s, you know, movie. Remember Turner and Hooch? Anybody remember that movie? That dog was ugly. Pure ugly. Need to be shot. But anyhow, uh, slobbering everything else. But my kids were watching it, and literally within like five minutes, not mo mostly Micah because he's in that generation, of, you know, uh, he was like, when's this going to get going? <laughs> I'm thinking this is how movies always used to be. Now, what do we have now? I mean, just commercials. One thing after another, one thing after another. Just talk fast. Everything is just fast, 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 fast. Why do you think that is? They don't want you paying attention too long because they're trying to subliminally give you things. You know, like, oh, I gotta go to the store. <laughs> gotta buy some new makeup. Even if you know, don't. And all the stuff that just comes across, they're, 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 they're doing that because they know that your attention span is not more than six minutes. So they will literally stretch, literally, a commercial break every six minutes. Pretty much. You ever notice that? You're watching a really good show, like, oh, this is so good. And all of a sudden, boop, there it goes. Hulu's notorious for that. I hate Hulu. Keeps, and the same commercials over, you ever notice that the same commercials over? How many with me? Same commercials over and over and over again. What do you think they're trying to do? Push on you what they want you to do. And so here's the thing. God, when he wants to stretch, it's going to take us longer than six minutes. That's why you spend a long time at times not getting what you need from God because God wants to say, okay, you need to go further. <laughs> You need to know a little more resistance. You, know, you need a little more stretching to happen in your life. You're like, oh God, I can't take it anymore. And he says, yes, you can. And you will if you follow me. I want to talk about Ashdod and what, and what happened in the Bible. It's, it comes out of 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. It says, The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation upon them and afflicted them with tumors. Now, I want to stop right there. A lot of times, and I'm not blaming, listen, in the Bible, you know, said, what did they do to sin? You know, who knows? But there are a lot of times that God will allow things, conflict in our lives, sicknesses and everything else, to draw us close to his side. I just read it. God inflicted tumors upon the people. He brought it to them. Please listen to me. It's not so he can hurt you. It's so that you open your eyes and pay attention to what he's trying to say to you. Because life is short. Amen? Life is short. And the same God that brought the tumor is the same God that could deliver the tumor. So I believe in miracles and healings all through the Bible. But I want you to see something. Why does he bring the tumors? You see, when the men of Eshad saw what was happening, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us. See, they stole the ark. <laughs> Dummies. 
You know, it's like Indiana Jones. You know what I'm saying? How many of Indiana Jones on the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Remember that? Those dumb Germans, those Nazis took the, you know, Ark and opened it up, and there they go. Poof, they're gone. But anyhow, you know, it says, because his hand is heavy upon us, upon Dagon, our God. So they've been serving Dagon, their God. And you can do some history later on that. But, but Dagon was their God, and they were serving Dagon, their God. And God said, no, I want you to know me. <laughs> Tumors. By the way, he stole from me. This is what happens. Now, the people of Ashad had just witnessed a great victory over their God, Dagon. But they didn't act upon their revelation until they were inflicted with tumors. You hear me? Today, many people don't respond to biblical truth until they experience pain or suffering. Like the old saying goes, and there's a DC talk. You probably don't know who DC talk is, but I do. Old school Christian music, right? Some people got to learn. Some people got to learn the hard way. I sang it actually when I was a teenager to church. It's the first time singing in front of church. I was nervous as all get out. Some people got to learn the hard way. I guess I'm the kind of guy who has to find out for myself. I had to learn the hard way. Darling, I'm on my knees and I'm crying for your help. And there's some raps with it and everything else. My buddy rapped with it and everything else. And I was like, man, we're awesome. But we weren't. <laughs> but we move the people's spirits, I'll tell you that much. But it's true. Some people got to learn the hard way. In fact... DC Talk, if you want to do some right now, Kevin Max has walked away from God completely. He's one of those that has fallen away. The Bible says they're the great falling away. And I love Kevin Max. I love his voice and everything else. I'm just a side note. But yeah, he sings that song, but he hasn't learned, has he? And so with us, we can sing the songs on Caleb and whatever it is and do all the motions and everything else. But if our hearts are not in it, what does it matter? You'll fall away. And so I want you to see something. So in this moment, God is desiring them. He loves them. And, and Revelation, it always talks about, you know, even though everything's falling apart and I don't know, I don't want to be here when all that happens, right? I want to be gone like now, today. But, you know, when all Revelation takes place, you think the people would say, when God gives them chance or a chance, please repent, turn from your sins, walk away. You know, when a meteor hits and destroys a third of the sea and everything else and you know, your flesh become boils and maggots and everything else. And the Bible talks about all that is left behind after the rapture of the church. You know, it goes on and on and on. You think people would go, oh, God, you're right. We're wrong. No, that's not what it says. It says they gnash their teeth and they raise their fists at God saying, it's your fault. That's what it says. And so here's the thing. We need to be willing to listen to what the Bible says and not just turn to God when we're, you know, when the flesh is being tested. When your flesh is being tested by God, you need to come out of your flesh and work by the Spirit of the Lord and say, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but God, you will show me because you've proved time and time again in my life that you've always been there. You see, God's desire is to make us more like Him. And therefore, we need to expand our attention span. <laughs> okay? Slow down and listen to the voice of God. God's always speaking. Did you know that? Say, no, he's not. I don't hear him. Have you really spent the time to hear God's voice or just make an excuse? Because God is always speaking. He'll speak through people. He'll speak through his word. He'll speak to you personally. But how much have you honestly sat there and said, I want to hear from God. And so I'm going to get everything out of my life that would cause me not to hear from God. See, we can make excuses all we want. But when we start putting the matter to the fact is that we're lazy. We are. All of us. Me. God, I need an answer. Now. Now. But it don't come. Because God wants to expand our attention span. You see? So we've got to learn to respond to the Bible first in all things before you go to the valley experiences. In striving to follow the Bible first, we are building our faith and attention towards God. So once you know your word and you get in the valley, you're not easily shaken because of the valley. Amen? Two, valley experiences are necessary to test our commitment level. Matthew 16, 25 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. In Russia, Christians are tested by hardship, but in America, you are tested by your freedom. 
Think about that for a moment. And testing by freedom is much harder than persecution. Nobody pressures you about your religion, not yet. But nobody tells you're going to put you on a cross and burn you or any of that stuff that goes on in the Muslim countries or anything else. Nobody comes and, you know, and t- pulls you out of your house and says, you're not going to see your family ever again. This is it. No, because we have freedom. And I'm grateful for that freedom for now. And, and so here's the thing. So you relax and you're not concentrated on Christ. You have everything you need on his t- and, and you don't concentrate on his teaching and how he wants you to live and be honestly before him, just be tra- you know, transparent and say, God, I don't have this right, but you can help me out in this. And so because we got everything we need in America, it's be honest. The smallest thing we don't have is something that, it, like, to the people over in Iraq or whatever that are wishing they had, you know? Or do have. So the smallest thing we do have, you know? And so when I think about this, real discipleship implies real commitment. Jesus wanted commitment from his disciples, did he not? If we try to save our physical life from death, pain, or discomfort, you may be risking your eternal life reward. If we protect ourselves from pain, we begin to die spiritually and emotionally. Pain is good. We made a slogan, you know, pain stirs us on. But it's the truth. Pain is a great motivator to go past your laziness and your complacence and everything else. It helps you to see that you're not really as tough as you think you are. It wants to make you tougher. I'll say this. Yesterday... I thought, first, first time I had my stupid water shoes on, my wife bought me for $3 at Walmart, because, you know. But anyways, I put them on, and I'm like, man, I got this thing, you know. And Tim and, and dumb Jeff back there get up there, no problem. I'm just kidding, Jeff, but I love you. But they get up there, just climb up there, like, hey, we're awesome. I'm like, I got this, and I get up there, I'm like, Whoa! pain. Like, I thought I was having cardiac arrest right then and there. You know? Because I didn't realize, honestly, what was going to be involved before I signed up to go climb these stupid inflatables. <laughs> Did you realize what you signed up for when you had to learn how to climb the mountain of God? Did you start in the valley. You always start in the valley. Our lives turn inward and we lose our intended purpose. When we daily give our lives in service to Jesus, we discover the real purpose of living. I may experience that. You finally gave it up. You finally stopped fighting. Stop stop resisting. And now you feel like this presence is just not going away. It's real. It's evident. It's changing your life. How many are here? Anybody with me this morning? That's it. (laughs) Altar time. Number three. Valley experience is necessary for growth. I put this in here. I thought this was funny. This made me laugh. A company feeling it was time for a shakeup and growth hires a new CEO. This new boss is determined to rid the company of all slackers. On a tour of the facilities, the CEO guy notices a guy leaning on the wall. The room is full of workers, and he wants to let them know that he means business, this new CEO. The CEO walks up to the guy and asks, how much money you make, man? How much money you make a week? A little surprise, a young fellow looks at him and replies, I make $300 a week, sir. Why? The CEO then hands the guy $1,200 in cash and screams, Here's your four weeks pay. Now get out and don't come back. Feeling pretty good about his first firing, the CEO looks around the room and asks, Does anybody else want to tell me what that goof off did there? One with a sheepish grin, one of the other workers muffled, He's a pizza delivery guy from Domino's. <laughs> That CEO got some experience with growth, didn't he? I thought it was funny. I was like dying. I was like, I put that in there. That's funny. Care who you are. <laughs> twelve hundred dollars for a pizza. Hebrews twelve twelve says, "Let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the Author and Perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God." You see, when we face difficulty and discouragement, it is easy to lose sight of the big picture that's for us. 
God sees our beginning and the end of our life. Valley experiences is the training ground for Christian maturity to make us what God already sees. So maybe you should start asking God, what do you see, God, that I can't see right now, that I'm so broken, things are falling apart around me. What do you see that I can't see? Wouldn't it be better if he just gave you a glimpse of what he sees in the end for you? It would stir you on, right? I've got this notion, me and Tim yesterday, we were talking about it, but I'm, I'm in the fight club, better get ready for it. I'm not sure where I'm at with it right now, but how many ever heard of the Tough Mudder contest? Hmm? It's in Pittsburgh. It's $120 a person to go be stupid. The Tough Mudder contest is a grueling 12 miles. Not 14, I looked at it, man, because it, 14 is too much, but 12, you know, 12 miles. And you go through different obstacles. I'm like, whatever, I've heard people do this. We could do this. And then I look on the internet and I was like, hmm, Vince, what do you think? <laughs> we were looking last night. Hey, man, they got electrocution. They got to go through things and get electrocuted. How awesome is that? It's 12 miles of running. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure, Ben. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, do you see the training that comes with it? We got a plan. We're just going to show up like, you guys are awesome. Let's buy the t-shirts. It's like, did it? Tough mutter. <laughs> but anyhow, but, but, but there is like pools of like, they put ice in it. Triple, triple layers of ice and you have to swim through it. You have to climb monkey bars, which that ain't good for me at all. Okay. <laughs> 60 feet across like mud pit. I mean, and mud so like you can barely even move. And by the time you get, you're supposed to stir each other on. You got to go up ropes course. You got to like marine style. Got to go up over. There's so much involved in this. What am I missing? Am I missing something? Other than, oh, boxes you got to climb on. It looks like boxes. And you covered, you covered the majority of I mean, there, there's a lot. There's like 15 different things you have to go through on a 12 mile journey. I thought this would be great for Fight Club. Huh? But the truth of the matter is. The toughest guy in Fight Club, we're going to probably get halfway, or not even halfway, I don't think, and we're going to be like, I want to quit, I'm done, I'm done. Because that's the journey, man. If you want to get to the end, you're going to have to struggle. And that's why I, I'm kind of thinking about doing it, but I looked at the training they have to do, I don't feel like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point in, in the matter is, is that we struggle. See, it's our, it's our job to yield to God's refining in our lives. He wants to throw us in an electrocution puddle, you know, and see how long you can take it, you know, because he sees our potential of what we be, can become. If I make it to the end of the Tough Motor Contest, I'll be awesome. I'm not being prideful. I'm just saying I'll know I'm awesome because I did it, you know, and then I'm going to go to Applebee's and eat all I want, you know what I mean? But, but <laughs> Dustin, you ready, man? I thought of you right off the bat, dude. <laughs> Applebee's, bro. <laughs> but it develops our patience. It makes our final victory sweet in the process of being in the valley. Number four, pain is necessary to experience God's power and grace. Matthew 8, 16, 17 says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. You see, Matthew, all through the, his book, shows the kingship of Jesus. He shows and proves that Jesus had all authority on earth. Jesus healed, delivered, and set people free. And Matthew records those events to show us Jesus is Lord of all. When we receive, the, when we receive the devastating news, it's an opportunity for us to receive God's grace and power in our lives. We need to reach out to him in faith right until the end. When Silas wasn't able to come home, it was painful. I already been through a lot of pain with my wife and with this whole, you know, delivery and everything else. But, but here's the thing. Now that he's home, I thank God for the poopy diapers. You understand what I'm saying? Because they're a blessing. <laughs> Because why? God brought him through his little valley. My son had to struggle to nick you for quite some time. He had to figure out things, you know? And, and, and we had to go through a valley of not having a home with us, you know? And I just, I think about that. 
And now, you know, it is, is now that he's pressed through, he's going to press in other little valleys, and we're going to press in valleys. But it, it, it's part of life, ladies and gentlemen. Now, sickness and evil are all consequences of living in a fallen world, okay? You understand that? You were born into a fallen world. But in the future, when God removes all sin, there will be no more pain, come on, no more sickness, come on, and no more death, as we know, as the Bible says. And that's why we're here this morning, because that's the final, final, tough mutter, Jesus mutter, you know, moving past the line. I did it! Jesus' healing miracles were a taste of what the whole world would one day experience in God's kingdom. But it's also for now, right now. And so I said, let God's glory fall as he wants to make it fall. Let people be healed in Jesus' name and set free in Jesus' name. No more of this bondage in Preston County. People are dying right and left because of evil. I'm tired of it. You know, praying God's kingdom come into our situations is a good thing. God wants his kingdom to come, you know. In closing the altar, the story is told about the baptism of King Agnes by St. Patrick in the middle of the 5th century. Sometime during the rite, St. Patrick leaned on a sharp pointed staff, inadvertently stabbed the king's foot. After the baptism was over, St. Patrick looked down at all the blood, realized what he had done and begged the king's forgiveness. Why did you suffer this pain in silence, sir? The saint wanted to know. The king replied, I thought it was all part of the ritual. <laughs> now, in baptisms, that would suck. We don't do that, right? It's not part of the ritual in water baptism. We know that. But pain and suffering, the life of the Christian is. And guess what that, where that happens in the valley? You see, we cannot escape valley experiences. We cannot escape them. I'm sorry, but it's coming, okay? If you've not been through, it's coming to you. But we can view the valley differently from now on. This is where I want to just kind of reiterate on. You see, we think the valley is a bad place, but the shadow of the mountain only covers part of the valley, okay? The valley is wide, and if we walk towards where the sun, the sun hits the pasture is there. Listen to me now. And the shepherd, and that's the only place on the mountain that's green that grows, is the one area in the valley where the sun shines. Everywhere else is desolate. And so if we move towards the sun or the shepherd, we'll be fine. Amen? So that's where rest is and feeding happens. It gives strength to climb the mountain. Before you can climb a mountain, you've got to rest. You've got to learn and say, well, the valley's not a place of rest. It's horrible. I hate it. Yeah, so do all of us. But you can find rest at the valley. I just shared it with you. Draw close to the sun. Draw close to the shepherd. And by the way, you're going to meet other sheep there. I'll be there. I'm there a lot. <laughs> Meeting my grace. Come on over. It's plenty. So we stir each other on because there is a mountain that's coming. We know it's there. We just haven't climbed it yet. You see, the highs, the lows, and the so-sos give strength to climb the mountain. You see, unlike the mountaintop, the valley is wide and vast. And we tend to think it's isolated. As I just said, I kind of moved ahead a bit. But, but we stay to ourselves in the valleys. I've seen this many times to stay to ourselves. They walk away from the church or whatever, and they do their own thing because they just feel like God left them. How many of them I'm talking about? Okay? But this is it. To, you know, we stay in those low spots. But if we walk out towards the sun, again, we will see that there are many of us that are there. We just got to rely on one another and God. We can stir each other on. And there are valleys coming for the church, I promise you, in the future. And I want to stir each other on. When COVID hit, we didn't give up. We didn't stop. And, no, I mean, I, when I got COVID, I went up there and preached. Do you remember that? That was hell. I felt like crap. But I wanted to make sure the word came forward. I let my flesh die. <laughs> and then afterwards, I pretty much felt dead. You know, I got done preaching. But, but I wanted to make sure that God's word was presented. Even people told me, you don't need to do that. You don't need to just stay rest. I said, no, I can't rest. 
if people are suffering, if people don't have encouragement during this time, what could happen to the church? You see, we may not feel like it, but we don't go by our feelings, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody say amen. amen. Liars, you go all the time by your feelings. But anyways, moving on. I do. But we, we tend to think that, you know, we're all alone, but you're not. Because the shepherd's there, the sheep are there, ready to heal and strengthen you. So in reality, it's not a bad place, is it? It's really not. If you just let somebody pray with you, help you through things. But we need to look at our trials as blessings because they will produce in us a character that God wants us to have according to, according to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Some situations that we go through are unavoidable and they will catch you off guard by surprise. It's just going to happen. But if you will keep your eyes, watch this, on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, you will make it through. God uses trials because it gets our attention, number one. Two, tests our commitment. Three, helps us grow. And four, God's power and grace are experienced. I just covered all of those. There is purpose in suffering. And so I will say this. Please allow the Lord and, and, and the Trinity to build you and stretch you as a person right now. You resist, you resist, you resist. You won't grow. You won't grow. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? This altar is going to be wide open because I believe right now people need to be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. Nobody's going to bother you. If you need prayer, we'll pray with you, but you're just going to come here and seek the shepherd right now. Maybe you feel like you're in the valley and you don't know how to, you're like, am I ever going to come out of this? You know, I just feel like, and sometimes we put ourselves in the valley and that's true too, you know, but, but God is there. God wants to minister to you in the lows, in the lows as well as the highs and the so-sos. And so in this moment, man, just bask in the, in the valley and in the, in the, in the wonderful pasture that he's placed you in Cornerstone. And the sheep, you don't realize there's sheep around you that are still the same place. And they, you don't know what's going on in their life, but you don't, they don't know what's in your life, but God knows all your lives. He wants to help you and minister to you. Anybody else? The altar's wide open. We're just going to play this in the background. Before I do that, though, I'm going to ask if there's somebody that needs salvation this morning. It simply means you want to surrender to Jesus. You want to repent from your sins, walk the other way towards Jesus instead of your way, and receive him as your Lord and Savior. It's not that hard. You say yes, and you start learning to follow. That's what it really means to be saved. I mean, things don't change overnight. It takes time, lots of time. But if you've walked away from the Lord, or you never came to the Lord's, you know, and you're, you're, you're just tired of fighting, just tired of doing things. Would you just raise your hand? I just, I just want to pray with you. Okay? I'm going to ask a simple question. How many are in the valley right now? How many are in the valley? I'm going to say it one more time. How many are in the valley? What are you going to do about it? You're going to whine? going to complain? You're going to gripe? You're going to stay in the shadow of the, of the mountain, the, the lowest part of the mountain? Or are you going to move towards? And you're going to ask to be prayed for? Are you going to ask that... You, you, you can get strength from those around you and from, most importantly, God, the shepherd. You see, valleys are not fun on your own, but there's a purpose and there's a reason, there's an answer, and God wants to bring and show you that so he can get you to the next place. And I'll talk about that next Sunday.